Well, welcome everybody. <clears throat> My name is Lucy Tallon and I'm Head of Mental Health and Wellbeing at the Film and TV Charity. And this event this evening, uh, we have organised with Women Behind the Camera to talk about bullying and harassment and the sorts of support services that there are out there in the industry. Uh, and really just to have a workshop kind of format, because I know that there are some issues that many of you experience on a regular basis, whether it happens to you or to your colleagues. Um, and we want this to be quite uh, an informal safe space where you can ask questions and we can maybe discuss some things uh, quite openly. I will say though, I will have a request um, that we don't talk about any incidents in detail. So I would ask that you don't share any personal details about your own stories or about others. Um, as I said, we're going to, we are recording this. So for legal reasons, we can't go into specific details, but also we would encourage you to call our support line, um, our bullying advice service by the film and TV charity, which I'm going to be telling you more about later. But on that service, you can talk to someone who has the right professional experience in how to handle um, uh, anything that you want to share. Um, and that would be a much safer, um, more appropriate space to be sharing individual stories and you can receive correct support. So without further ado, uh, thank you all for keeping your, your, uh, yourselves on mute. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce myself and just tell you a little bit about me and then I will introduce you to Kate and Aga, although I suspect many of you know Aga already, um, and then we can get started. So I'm Lucy Tallon, as I've said, and I've helpfully put on my Zoom title. I work at the film and TV charity, I'm head of mental health and wellbeing, but I also lead the work that we do on bullying and harassment. I've been working at the charity for a couple of years um, and the work that we do uh, as bullying, bullying and harassment is part of the bigger programme of work on mental health. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we undertook some research which some of you may have heard of called the looking glass uh, and that found that there was an extraordinary high rate of mental health problems in our industry in the UK film and tv industry uh, and unfortunately although I suspect it may not come as a surprise to many of you uh, bullying was one of the primary causes or correlations between poor mental health um, and the experience of bullying and harassment in the industry. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the services that the, the charity offers um, and many of you may not have even heard of the charity so this is a really great opportunity and I'm just so grateful um, that you've given up your evenings and you've come to spend some time with us so we can tell you a little bit about it. Um, and we're joined today by Kate Wilson from Fury Films, who is a woman who wears many hats, she's, not, she's, she's wearing no hats at the moment, um, but I, I will let you introduce yourself, Kate, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I am a producer and I'm also a lawyer and I'm also a consultant and I was working actually with Lucy on the Whole Picture Programme, which is the mental health part of the services offered by the um, Film and TV Charity uh, for kind of during lockdown and then on COVID support and had this idea for the app, the Call It um, app. And actually I can see that one of my co-founders is joining right now, hi Della, um, which was developed with Della Thomas and Jules Hussey. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that later on in the, in the evening. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Kate. And Aga, uh, for those of you who haven't come across Aga before, because this event is open to the public, we've had it on our social media channels. Uh, Aga Shelga got in touch with us quite recently and asked if we could set up this sort of event um, but with women behind the camera and anyone else who might be able to share some information about support. Aga, do you want to just say a little bit about women behind the camera and uh, why this issue is important to you? Hello, I, my name is Aga. I work as a camera operator and also I am a co-founder of Women Behind the Camera, which is a database for female technicians. We've got over 200 women across all grades. Um, and trying to be or aiming to be a, a community of women supporting each other. And I, I got in touch with Lucy and her team a few months back because of the disheartening um, information we've been getting about um, racism, about bullying and sexual harassment. And 
I know that charity has been working really hard and I was hoping that tonight we can find out a little bit more about the work you're doing. Um, and Lucy invited Kate. Thank you, thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for it. And I, I feel like um, there are these wonderful organizations working towards the behavior change in the industry, but also from an individual. But I think like we all have to get together to change the situation or the behavior. Um, and I do hope this is maybe tonight's session, like the first step forward. Um, and yeah, let's continue. And thank you so much to all of you who joined tonight. And let's, yeah, let's have the first chat. And hopefully that's the beginning of the dialogue we can, we can have between all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Aga, that's great. And I will um, be leaving, uh, I will share some resources that you can share with your network because it might be quite a lot of, stuff to take in um, and would really encourage you to get back in touch. So if you think of anything that you didn't have a chance to ask this evening or you have any questions that you want to ask privately, please don't hesitate to get in touch. So I will just start off uh, by telling you a little bit about the charity. Um, you may not have heard of it. It's called the Film and TV Charity. Um, I certainly hadn't heard of it before I'd been working, before I started working there. Um, and we know that this amazing industry can, can be a tough one. I mean, all of you can testify to that. It's got long hours and high expectations and, and systemic inequalities. They all contribute to a strain on the mental health and well-being of our colleagues. And the resulting talent drain is, is pretty well documented. Um, so thanks to the generosity of people and organisations from across the industry, we are an organisation that's been around for nearly 100 years. Uh, we provide free confidential support to people at every stage of their career. So from freelancers and employees to managers and leaders, we offer emotional, financial uh, and practical support or just a listening ear to anyone in the industry who needs it. We're totally neutral and completely independent. And I can't stress the importance of that, especially when it comes to issues like this. You don't have to be a member. We're not affiliated to any particular organization um, and it is 100% confidential. Um, but we are committed to working with other industry bodies and employers to advocate for and build a more supportive film and TV community that works together to make our industry better for everyone. Um, now, all our support services can be accessed via our support line, which is open 24 seven and that in itself I think is pretty amazing. I've worked in the charity sector for quite a long time. I used to work for Mind, the mental health charity, and even their support line is not open at night. So you can call any time, day or night. Uh, it's 0800 054 0000. Um, that, I'll put that number up later um, and it will be in the resources that we share. You can also visit our website, which is www filmtvcharity.org.uk and we have a live chat function there um, which is quite popular. So I mentioned that we've been around for nearly 100 years. Uh, we started life as the Cinema and Television Benevolent Fund and that saw the charity supporting quite a small number of beneficiaries into retirement and beyond. Um, in 2018 we refocused our objectives so that we could reach many more people and have a, a really positive transformative impact on people's lives. And we launched the support line in 2018. And with that, we started a process of developing our non-financial support with a growing focus on mental health, emotional and practical support, because so many of the calls that we were receiving through the support line were either directly about mental health or had some sort of mental health issue intertwined with it. Um, the Looking Glass survey, as I mentioned, um, followed up on that work um, and really created an evidence base for the work that we do in the industry. Um, we had a COVID recovery fund to support those affected by the pandemic last year and the discourse that followed Black Lives Matter in summer 2020 have all given us a platform to further develop our support and to encourage people to stay in the industry and advocate for better work. So we, ask, we hope that you will feel we are standing up for you and we want to gain the trust of, of you and for those who particularly feel underrepresented in their industry or feel outnumbered in their workplace. Um, we support people, I should say, and this, this event is for people 
with obviously with women behind the camera, but we support people right across the value chain in film and TV. So from writing and development to production, post, uh, VFX and animation, broadcasting, um, distribution and cinema exhibition. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what else the charity does before I come on to the bullying and harassment support services. Um, just to give you an overview, um, I won't go into much detail, but you can ask questions at the end. Uh, but I just want to give you a little bit of a flavour of, of what we do. So with our mental health support, we offer a range uh, of, of services that continue being developed and enhanced. Um, so we have the 24 hour listening service and via that you can access um, six sessions of private therapy. So that's cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, and that can be either on the phone or by video call or in person. And that's pretty extraordinary, actually. I mean, it's you, you can access that much more quickly. Not always, I shouldn't say that, but in most cases, much more quickly than you would be able to access that from the NHS. Um, and we also offer bereavement counselling um, and several other online tools. Um, our other services, our other non-financial services are legal advice. So uh, if you again contact the support line, um, you, they will arrange a call back from a qualified legal advisor with the relevant specialism. And that's particularly relevant today if you are wanting to check something in employment law or something about your rights or even thinking you might want to take something further. Um, and we also offer financial guidance. So as well as financial assistance, the charity can offer uh, general advice or arrange a call for more personalized advice to help you manage finances. Um, uh, and our support, um, our financial support uh, grants uh, have just been relaunched actually, and there's further details about them. Uh, on our website, but they are there to help in a stopgap situation, mostly if you are facing an unexpected bill or an unexpected financial strain, which is stopping you going to work, taking a new job, going to an interview. Um, that's the sort of thing that we can potentially help with. Uh, there are eligibility criteria, but I would really encourage you just to give the support line a ring um, and talk through uh, what's going on and what, what we might be able to help with. Um, there's more work that we're doing kind of on the strategic level as part of our mental health programme, but uh, I really don't want to talk too much, so I can, I might refer to some of that later, um, but I'm, I'm going to come now on to our bullying uh, support services, and I am going to share my screen. Uh, I... Uh, been really trying not to over PowerPoint people. So it's really quite an achievement for me to have got this far without sharing my screen. Uh, I don't want to jinx it now. There we go. So I think you can probably see my notes as well, but I'm not particularly fussed about that, given that I will be sharing this resource with you. Um, so if you call our uh, support line, you can ask to be put through to our bullying advice service. And you will make an appointment and arrange for a call back. Uh, and it, this service really is the first of its kind for people who work in our industry. Um, and it is available for free. It's actually the first of its kind, I think, in many industries because usually in the in the research that I've done if people if there is a bullying help or harassment helpline usually you will actually get put straight through to the legal team or for emotional support but what we are trying to do with this is um, have people on our team um, who have got experience of working in the industry themselves so they really understand what it's like particularly to work in production um, have uh, uh, some sort of um, have experience supporting people emotionally um, and have understanding of the legal and HR situation as well. So uh, at the moment we 
have one advisor, although we, we are recruiting for the second one at the moment. So uh, she is absolutely wonderful and we've had incredibly positive feedback about her. So what she will do, she can do a whole range of things. And I think the kinds of calls that she's receiving are so varied. Um, some of them are, I'd, probably, I'd say probably about half of them are re refer to historic cases and half of them are about things that are happening at the moment. Um, the majority of them are from women, probably about 80%. Um, uh, only about a third are from people of colour. Um, and there's a real mix in terms of roles and genres. Um, and what the advisor will do is first of all, just be there to listen. And that's something that is not something that everybody gets. And it is really important to be able to talk through your situation in detail, to be heard um, uh, and be able to talk to someone who is going to uh, listen at the right times and prompt questions at the right times. Um, the, she will offer you personalized support. So it's completely confidential and independent. Um, and she can help you understand really what your options might be. So many people just don't know where to start. Um, very often people just say, I, I don't know, does this count as bullying? Does this count as harassment? What, what's the difference between bullying and harassment? You know, what, what can I do? What are my options? Um, uh, and um, that is a totally valid thing to bring up with her. She can help you with that as well. Um, and then she can help you understand, you know, what your options might be if you want to raise it internally at work, if you want to, if you feel very uncomfortable raising it with someone who is meant to be your, uh, your direct line manager, your safeguarding lead on that production, if you wanted to escalate it to go to the broadcaster or the film commissioner. She can help you understand, you know, what that might look like, what it might entail. She's never going to say, I think you should do this, I think you should do that. It's more about helping you understand what that might, what might happen when you do that um, and help you weigh up whether that's the right thing you want to do. And other things she can talk you through about the options to talk to other industry bodies. So for example, to talk to BEC2, I suspect that many of you are members of BEC2 and actually have apologies from my sort of um, opposite number at BEC2 who very much wanted to be here, but um, wasn't able to do it at, at the last minute, but back to have obviously offer support to people, to members uh, who are going through these experiences. But there are other organizations as well, such as Directors UK who have their own code of conduct. Um, if either uh, someone, had, uh, one of their members is going through something or if there is an allegation against one of their members and they can, uh, they will in some cases undertake a, a, uh, an investigation. So we're still developing this service. Feedback is very welcome. Um, and we want it to be accessible to everyone. And I would really, that if you only remember one thing from today or from everything I'm saying, I would encourage you to ring this number to ask for an appointment. Um, I really don't think that you'll regret it. Um, the other support services that we offer in this area, there's two of them. One of them is called Spot, which is a digital tool, and the other is a sort of, is an online directory of anti-bullying resources. So Spot is a digital tool that is accessed through our website, and it creates safe private records of any instances of bullying harassment that you might have experienced, or if you've witnessed yourself. And I would really encourage people who have witnessed things to use it as well. And I know that it may seem like a, a bit of a faff to write everything down, but it is the number one thing that any legal or clinical expert or HR expert will say when you're going through this situation is you really need to keep a detailed record. So it ensures that you capture crucial details and it allows you to um, upload other things like emails and screenshots. So just everything is saved in one place. It's completely private. You can generate a downloadable PDF, which you can then use to send to someone else if you want to, or you can just store it there for as long as you want. So just to be clear, this isn't a reporting mechanism. You can't then press a button and say, submit to that's no, that functionality is not there. It's just there for you. So you can decide what to do with it and keep all the crucial details that you may need to rely on later in one place. Um, you then get a, a dashboard to help you spot patterns of behavior. 
Um, it provides as a sort of chat bot that talks you through it, although there is an app option to just fill in the details if you just want to just quickly jot things down and save it. Um, and it provides you with definitions of bullying and different types of harassment on the way and signposts you to sources of help. I mean, if there is a mental health benefit to doing it, actually, it seems it's a deceptively simple thing to do, but it can help you process the experience, think a bit more carefully, sort of have that relief from turning it over and over in your mind. Um, and actually, I hope that people who are using it, um, particularly if they are feeling extremely anxious and nervous, possibly very early on in their career, and really don't know where to turn and perhaps don't even feel in a place where they feel they can pick up the phone yet. When you're sitting in front of your computer and you think, I need some help, and you're reading this website, you're reading that website, but you're like, well, how does this apply to me? I hope that the idea of just starting saying, okay, well, maybe I could do this, I could start to fill this in, is just maybe that very first step of kind of, when it comes to sort of therapy speak and I don't have a clinical background but kind of owning the experience and naming what's going on and can get you going on that path of addressing it. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, the anti-bullying directory actually before I do so um, is a place where we have put the most useful resources we think are out there uh, across the industry on this issue. Um, there are so many resources on every website um, and we have picked the ones that we think are the most useful and we have um, categorised them so we, it's as easy as you can make it within the slightly strict confines of the functionality of our website to navigate. Um, so if you don't know where to start, it's not a bad place to start and I would encourage you to go and have a look. And with that, I really am going to stop sharing. I'm going to hand over to Kate now who's going to tell you about this fantastic new app called Call It that she and her colleagues have produced. And then we will open things up for discussion and questions. Thank you. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I think it'd be really great if I could persuade people to download the app. And what I've done is I've generated a sort of pretend group as if we were the crew on a production to show you how it works. So if you have an iPhone and go into the app store, it's call it, or if you go into Google Play, it's call it with an exclamation at the end on both ones. And I did look at the links and we'll just quickly put them in the chat here too. Um, and while you're downloading that app, I will, I will give you a little, um, bring up a slide that shows you how it works and what the experience will be and tell you a little bit about the background of the app. Um, Really rather recently, about six months ago, I met a TV producer who I believe is somewhere in this room right now, um, Jules Hussey, and a TV director, Delveth Thomas, who was here at the very beginning of this call. And um, they've been thinking for some time about ways in which they can make an impact on experiences of bullying and harassment that they were seeing around them at work. And um, and we started talking about the best way to use things that were tools that were available for us. So a QR code, for example, is a great way to swipe in. Um, the importance of anonymity when making uh, reports about bullying and harassment, feeling that your privacy is being respected. And also we talked a lot about individual and collective accountability with these issues. And we started to come up with an idea that pretty much became uh, the app that we, that we published a couple of weeks ago and that we're now um, sharing with pilot productions to make sure it works before we roll it out across the industry. Essentially a producer or a project lead. So that could be, for example, a chief executive in a VFX house or even um, the managing director in a cinema space. Um, Signs up for signs up their project and gives a very small amount, amount of information about their project and generates a QR code. He gives that QR code, makes it available to everybody working within that workplace. And, and very simply, it needs to be swiped once ever before you're invited to check in every day and let your employer or engager know how you are being treated at work. So it's a really, really quick system. If you look at the first page here, um, that's just to make sure that if you've got more than, more than one production going, you're checking into the right production. So if you only have one production, you go straight into slide two, the daily check-in. 
obvious traffic light system. It's really about how you were treated at work during the day. It's not about whether or not you were happy. Like we all know how tough work can be in this industry, but if you were treated well, that is an obligation of your employer or engager. And that's really what we want to get to the bottom of. You're then asked whether you have experienced or witnessed bullying or harassment at work. And if you were to hit yes on this question, there'll be a drop down menu that takes you through the nine protected characteristics that sit under the Equality Act. Obviously, you don't have to pick one of those, but in legal terms, that is the difference between bullying and harassment. Is, uh, so it's quite important in terms of the data and in terms of the employer's obligations towards you. Throughout your time um, with this app, you'll have access to this final page, which does a few really, really important things. When it says get information about filing a port, what that means is you will be linked to the employers or the producers dignity at work policies so that if you wanted to file a report, you have absolutely no obligation to do so. But if you wanted to get into that process, you know exactly what you're doing. You'd be provided with the name, role and email address of an appropriate person to talk to formally or informally about any incident that you experienced at work. And you also have this opportunity to be signposted out of the app and taken to resources that exist in our industry to support people. So that includes things like the um, Mark Nelson Foundation that are health and safety for health and safety breaches, or obviously uh, all the amazing resources that Lucy was just talking about. Um, so if people have managed to download the app, I'm going to post a QR code. And really the best way for you to get to grips with this is just to have a play with it. Um, let me just get this in. Yeah, sorry, bear with me. Um, you know, it really is so easy to use and should be the kind of thing that takes only a moment out of every working day and that can be incredibly useful for you and for everyone you're working with. Sorry, I'm having a hard time attaching this. Bear with me, I'll keep, I'll keep going that. I'll get the QR code up. Um, your anonymity as the end user is entirely 100% protected by using this app. So you won't give the app store or anyone any information about yourself. Um, there is, of course, um, a, a dashboard that the producer has access that gives just that quantitative data, i.e. how many red lights, amber lights, green lights, and incidents of bullying and harassment are reported on any given day. And then what we do is provide tips for that producer or that project lead to take action and make sure the support that's required is provided. And that might be um, training. It might be just a really simple communication to remind people of what their rules are, perhaps that there's a zero tolerance approach to particular behaviors um, and potentially something with a bit more gravitas, like bringing in a third party, uh, possibly bringing in something like the film and TV charity to, to, to provide support if that's what's required. But we think it's really important to try to catalyze behavior changes to have this regular engagement where people can say if they're having good or poor experiences with work so that we know what good looks like and so that we can encourage green lights and better behaviors. And also so that we can all be accountable for improving behaviors within our working lives. Um, we're working on a partnership, which we, which we hope to have in place um, very soon with the Sir uh, Laney Henry Center for Media Diversity. And what they'll do is they'll look at the completely anonymized, re-anonymized um, production data and be able to identify any emerging trends of behaviors within the industry. So for example, um, we think that a, a hypothesis that's probably going to be quite easy to prove is that lower budget projects tend to have more issues around um, bullying and harassment. So we'll look at that. But there may well be some data that comes out of the industry-wide uh, use of the app that, that are not things that we understand or anticipate. So for example, we know that there is a skill shortage in the industry, but we also know that there's ageism within our industry, that people who are older have been working for a long time feel that they're being pushed out of the door well before they're prepared to leave. So how do we balance those two kind of bits of conflicting information? What we need is a decent evidence base so that we can look at ways to design um, interventions that are good for us as individuals, good for the community that we live within and also good for the industry as a whole. Um, I'm gonna to try to figure out how to share the QR code with you and perhaps um, should we, do we wanna open up for questions? What do you want to do next? Yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't I take uh, the first question while you can wrestle with your technology. Um, I'm just... Um admitting a couple more people into the room. Um, 
Does anybody have a question? You can either use the um, putting your hand up function, you can put it in the chat, um, and actually within the chat, if you'd rather um, stay anonymous, you can send it just directly to me as the host. So uh, the floor is yours. We're, we're here to answer, do our best to answer anything that you'd like to ask. That stressful silence when you think, somebody else go first. Oh, we've, we've done a great job then, if, if there are no questions. <laughs> Maybe I will start with one question. Yeah, uh, sure. I'm doing that, uh, for legal reasons, we're not able to talk about particular cases, but um, what what does it ha what happens with any cases reported to you uh, through any of your services? How do you deal with that? So one of the things that is really important about us being a charity is our independence. So we have to be very clear that we're not a reporting body. So we don't act on any information. So we won't, um, we won't contact an employer. We won't share that information with anyone. The only very exceptional circumstances where we might act on information is if we think that someone's life is in danger. So uh, the service that we offer is, is not a reporting service. Um, and that's really important at the moment for a number of reasons so that people can feel very safe and they can say whatever they want to say um, and so that we can sort of maintain our neutrality. We uh, are thinking about, we're talking to lots of other industry bodies um, and as I say, we've been trying to, you know, we are, this is the bullying advice service is a, is a service in development um, and we have been sort of wondering about whether it might be useful for some people who have been talking to the advisor because um, you can have options with her usually people have two um, they usually find that's enough given what she's able to offer them at that stage we have been wondering about whether it would be useful to have a sort of what we're calling the moment like a sort of soft advocacy service where perhaps someone from the charity could work with with a caller for a little bit longer it that might involve going with them to meetings um, if, when, if and when meetings get back in person, it might involve, um, you know, helping follow up with HR and adding a bit of weight to that. Not dissimilar, to be honest, to what um, BET2 or another membership organisation might do, but obviously not everybody is a member of BET2. And there are quite a few situations where BET2 can't operate. Um, for example, if the allegation is against someone, uh, it's historical and it's against a freelancer and that employer may not that company may not even exist anymore so there are certain situations where um bet you will want to help but can't help um so that's quite a long-winded way of answering your question that we don't we don't do anything with the information and i don't know whether that's a disappointing or a or a reassuring answer uh, well i don't know i think that all of us who would like to report or reported in the past would like to know what happened with with the case and i know Usually things should go through the production. But I think if, you, if you're in a position where you're just setting out and maybe you don't feel any support, you, you don't feel supported by your team, it's very difficult to, to make that first uh, step to report. But I think like um, I think it's, it's great that you're there and you might be the person who help, help to report somewhere else or follow up on HR. Um, I know, it's, I, I mean, I didn't know until recently that um, because of the legality of uh, harassment or um, bullying, we're not even able to mention names even if we, if we know the names of um, people who commit crimes. So I know it's quite fragile. But I think like just knowing that there is a place um, where you can go and help and ask for support and it's important. But I think it's important that those cases, you know, that those cases don't vanish or don't be only become. Uh, a data and I, I know it's very yeah. important to collect the data uh, but I think it's also important that maybe we push in a direction where we know those cases get reported somewhere because how can we change the behavior um, if 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 nothing comes out of it you know, yeah I absolutely hear what you say and m many people have said very similar things and the 
the call for uh, some sort of independent reporting body has never really been louder and stronger. And that's something that um, various people have been looking into. It's a, we were, it's a piece of research that we have planned to do. Um, the Time's Up have recently, uh, well, a few months ago, beginning of the summer, um, put, put together a proposal for an independent standards authority. And that is in the early days of uh, sort of um, being put out for consultation amongst the industry bodies. Um, I I wish I had a solution for you because this is a very unrelated, you know, this is there's very little regulation in our industry at the moment. There isn't such a body. And I don't disagree that there should be one. It's about who has access to that information, who uh, conducts the investigations, who makes the decisions then about sort of one way or the other, what kind of mediation and support is provided at the same time as sort of any sanctions that are put down, what do those sanctions look like, um, who follows up to make sure that they're being followed through. So those are the sorts of questions that need to be considered. Um, and I, you know, the charity doesn't have a view as to whether we should we should have there should be one or there shouldn't be one. Um, what we are committed to is trying to help our beneficiaries do all that research to say, okay, right, if we were going to have a body that did this, what would that look like? You know, if we're going to call for this give us something to lobby for. So that's what we want to help. We want that research to happen and whether we do it, whether Time's Up does it, whether another industry body does it, whether we all come together and really push in the same direction, it doesn't really matter. But I think you're quite right that that's what a lot of people want. Um, and there, is, there, isn't, there isn't one at the moment. And there is very little clarity about how to go about creating one. Again, I feel that's a rather unsatisfactory answer. No, no. Do you have any ideas about, you know, what you think, how you think that kind of system could work? Um, no, I don't. But I feel like the first step is to get people together in one room. Um, yeah. And like yourself, uh, I, I don't think many people, I didn't know about the charity till last year. Mm. Um, uh, so I think the first step is just get everyone together in one room and come up with the idea. I'm sure like you know, through brainstorming, we could we could come up with something. Kate, um, you have been, maybe you, I mean, you can probably... Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say that I do think it is a really, really complicated area. And um, actually, you know, when we uh, designed the app, we set a sort of list of principles and assumptions that we're making about the industry and how it works. And some of those principles include things like people should not be obliged to report. I think, for example, if you take what happened with Noel Clark and BAFTA, it felt to me that there was a lot of blame being put on women for their failure to report, that actually that they had to do that in order to stop behaviors. And um, I know from personal experience of sexual harassment that I, I've had experiences that it's taken me 20 years to feel comfortable speaking about, let alone if I had a kind of three week contract working on a show or working on a production, the idea that I would spend my time reporting behaviors that I was experiencing, it just seemed to me kind of ludicrous and also just requires a trust that it will take time to, to, to build. So, you know, I say that the other side of the coin is that I also believe absolutely in due process. I do not believe that there's value in naming and shaming um, without proper processes that can ensure that a person against whom an allegation is made has a fair opportunity to defend themselves, um, that, we, that there is a requirement for kind of an evidence base for if people are going to lose their jobs or lose their reputation in an industry. Um, I also believe that the, you know, the benefit the industry of the due process is that it would stop that individual from just moving from production to production if they are dangerous, if they are, um, uh, behaving in ways that are unacceptable, whether that's sexual harassment or racism or ableism or discriminating against any other workers within their, their working environment. So once you, you know, you really have to balance all of these principles and all of these beliefs against one another, and it is not easy to figure out the outcome. Um, I know that Time's Up is very, very keen on this independent standards authority. And certainly, 
you know, we know that the app that we've designed, it, life would be kind of easier if we could just point everywhere, everyone to one place and they'd get exactly the support that they want. Um, but again, I don't think anyone should be obliged to go and report and talk to people about the bad experiences that they've had. That often does not lead to positive results. And until there is real confidence in a system, in a process, in a body, um, real confidence in the protection of your own anonymity, real confidence in the protection of your own reputation and opportunities for work, then I think it's unrealistic to expect people to, to expect that to happen. As a general rule as well, I'm, I'm kind of not pro additional regulation in creative industries. And so I, you know, I, I would not want a regulatory body to be established for this. I want the industry to recognize that it's in their interests, their creative interests and in their business interests to make sure that the workplace is safe and the workplace is positive and remains somewhere where people feel that their voice is heard and that they are valued and their contributions have value. And that may sound a bit idealistic, but I know that that's a better way to make good shows and to make money. So I do think that it has legs. You know, I think we can go somewhere with that approach. Um, I just want to, I'm just gonna take a moment to just put the QR code. Anyone who's downloaded the app, I'm gonna just put the, share the QR code on the screen. And so if you put right. your camera on it, you should be able to see it. I'm sorry, I, it, it, I think because we're a big group. Can you see that? Yeah, it's pretty big, but does that make it? That probably doesn't matter. It's taking a different song so you can get your camera um, onto it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I love this. How's everyone doing? Uh, you know, I'm totally shamelessly selling my wares, but um, but it is really the best way to show how the app works. And what we're really keen to do is to make sure it does end up in the hands of people like you guys, because what we really need is your feedback and to tell us what you like about it, what you don't like about it, so we can make the changes before we roll it out and, and be confident that it's going to be used and it has the potential. To, to make that little bit of change in people's working lives. I'm gonna take that down then if everyone's had a, had a go. And I can email it around and you, know, you can share it with people via email, whatever you need to do to just let people play with it. So Kate, just to be clear, so, so scanning that QR code gives people the chance to, to play with the app and to sort of go through the user journey, but that data isn't going anywhere. That data isn't going anywhere and you'll see that it's called women behind the camera test. It's okay. just really so that so that I could create something so that you can you can see what the experience would be. And just to be clear, um, you would only need to scan the QR code once. So on any production so that the idea is that by scanning that code that one time you have at your fingertips all of the information that you need to tell people if you feel it, feel that you've been poorly treated to tell people if you feel you've been well treated as well. Um, to, to record that instant of bullying, harassment or discrimination of any kind, and to be signposted to dignity at work policies, the right person to talk to if something's happened and um, resources to support your own mental health and well-being. Thank you, Kate. No problem. Uh, and when are you planning, can you rem remind me, when are you planning to launch this on the on the industry. So we're in pilot part. mode now and um, a little bit depends on, on what kind of feedback we get, but we hope yeah. the architecture of the app is kind of right. You know, we, we feel quite clear about the principles that we need to, to stick by. And it's also an incredibly simple bit of machinery. It's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool. It still relies on and will never be a substitute for really great producers and really great leaders within the industry. Um, but we would hope that by the end of this year, so in December, I'm hoping that we'll be rolling it out across the industry. And we're already in conversations with vendors in the art sector in advertising and in games. Jules, yeah. co-founder of Call It, would you like to jump in? <laughs> All I was going to say was, guys, if you want to try using the app um, a few times in one day, we'll only let you do it once in a day. But if you delete the app and reinstall it and then scan the code again, you can keep trying it. So that's just a little tip. If you want to sit down and play with it for an hour, you'd have to keep um, deleting the app because it only lets you report once a day. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. That was a really awesome Zoom name you have there. Um, we've had a comment in the chat 
um, uh, from Heather about uh, a contact in the Wales Bectu branch to see if there's some sort of capacity to set up an HR entity in conjunction with Bectu. Um, absolutely put, put him, I'm, I'm assuming Sai is a he, but maybe oh, it's a he'd be really interested. Put him in touch with me. I can put him in touch with one of the, the leads at the Bectu um, London production branch who leads on these issues, uh, Paula Lamont. Um, and it's, it's a very good point about there being no HR in the film industry. Gosh, I mean, we must have heard that. We have heard that a lot, haven't we, Kate? And there's, there, there isn't enough HR. Um, uh, some commissioners are trying some interesting things. I mean, Netflix have this new um, production HR team so that any, any productions that they commission they have a dedicated team of, I can't remember if it's, I think it's six people, maybe it's four, who will work with that production company to support them with whatever kind of training and resources they need to support their production team properly, but will also act as a, a slightly neutral point, um, or at least a third party point that people in that production can go to. Um, but I haven't heard of that being common practice. I, it's certainly not the case so far as I understand in TV broadcasters. I haven't come across it in film either. Um, but if anybody does hear of any examples of particularly good practice, I would be so interested to hear that because that's actually what's so helpful is to hear, you know what, this is something that worked really well on the last production I was on. And it, you know, it was so simple or maybe it's, not that simple but it's not beyond the realm of possibility and if it's something that could be replicated elsewhere we'd love to hear about it um has anybody asked that, that that funny thing because I, I think when people hear the term hr they think of the kind of you know little back office and a person in a gray suit with lots of paperwork to get through and policies and procedures and actually i just like to think of it literally as human resource and remembering that we work in a creative industry that relies on human beings with great ideas and amazing work ethics and um, collaborative approaches to, to their working lives. And if you think of it that way and think of it as a resource that has to be protected and maximized, then it is amazing to me that we allow that resource to be so poorly treated sometimes and that we don't protect it. Um, you know, our, we have a great quote that came from Directors UK that essentially says, you know, if you had a lens that was being scratched every time you went to shoot, you'd make sure you got that camera team some better training, you'd make sure you explained to them how to treat that lens because you really can't afford as a production to be constantly replacing your lenses or not having a lens ready when you need it. Well, that's what we need to start doing with all the human beings, with all the crew on the set, is making sure that we protect them, that we invest in them, and that we manage that resource really carefully so that we get the most out of it. And so that that resource, those human beings, the people within, without whom we'd have no TV and no films and no online entertainment, um, that, that they are protected and they can deliver their absolute best day after day. I love your enthusiasm, Kate, but sadly, <laughs> we have never seen I'm I'm wildly optimistic for our industry. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, I am too. Um, and that's why I, I'm often disappointed. Yeah. I've never experienced a production who had great HR team, sadly. Um, and I, I, I was wondering if, um, Lucy, if your team would be, um, maybe could help us out to um, get studios together. Because I feel like we have to get all those big studios together to sort out the HR. Uh, resources um, because I think it has to come from from top you know from the big production um, I, I don't think that they any of them gets gets proper training and I think it's also something which which um, which should happen very soon um, so we can actually go with confidence to our productions and the report if there's an accident or incident at work um, with you know, with your support, or you know, hopefully we will be able to to report and 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 get the results. Um, I've been hearing about um, cases where people who committed crime on set have been reemployed, um, and I don't think we should we should experience um, those situations. I think it's been very upsetting for victims uh, to hear that 
people who committed crime are carry on working. Um, yeah, I totally understand that. I hope it will give you a little bit of optimism to hear that we have um, a task force that oversee our mental health work and they are the people who have not just helped fund this work, but they have committed to champion it and to implement it within their own uh, organisations and their, within their own productions or within their own commissions. Uh, Disney is part of that. Um, and you, we have uh, an Amazon, um, Warner Media. So we are beginning to make some progress with the studios. Something that we're going to be producing um, towards the end of this year, maybe beginning of next year, is something called a toolkit for mentally healthy productions. And that's what we're going to be encouraging the studios, the broadcasters and the production companies to use if they are really serious about putting in practice good procedures and policies um, on their production. And so there can be no excuse to say, oh, of course I want to do the right thing, but you know, I just don't know how to go about it. This is a step-by-step -step guide that makes it really easy, makes it re really easy to uh, get that right piece of, you know, we have template documents, we'll have case studies to show how it worked on a similar production. So there is no excuse for not having a proper process for reporting, for, for uh, making sure everybody knows about what that process is, what their options are, how they can go directly to the studio if they need to, because every studio will have a, an anonymous whistleblowing line as well. Again, I don't, I don't always want to be in a position where I'm encouraging people to report if they don't feel ready or if they have a lot of concern about what will happen to them. I understand that trust is really broken and that some cases are mishandled. So it's about understanding your options in an individual case. But, um, you know, one thing I guess we can, uh, you know, I, I can't I can't provide I wish I could sort of magic up a, a system, a body that could could handle all the complaints um, and process them for you. But what we can do is try and work in a positive way at the charity uh, and produce that kind of resource, which you, the people who are kind of at the coalface, as it were, can get together and you can put pressure on your producers, on your directors, on your execs. Um, to use they can you know if they if the studio has signed up to it if their production company has signed up to it or if every other production company signed up to it but they haven't there really is no excuse not to use it and so we will be launching that as i say in, a, in the next few months um, and we hope that that is going to have a huge impact on the industry great thank you i also um would like to hear more about counseling for people who um who are victims um because I, I, I feel like we're having this conversation today partly because of those few very brave people who actually became victims and reported it better. It's not very easy you know, for all of us who ever experienced um, any case of bullying or sexual harassment. It's not very easy to talk about this. So I would like to find out if there is a service for, or if you could tell me a little bit more about the service or counselling for people who maybe need to have that conversation and. and because um, I think it's quite traumatic going through process of reporting. Absolutely. It's incredibly traumatic. Yeah. I mean, the, it, it, is, it is a trauma and it is, it is a type of trauma and not everybody will end up with sort of clinically diagnosed PTSD, but there are different types of trauma um, disorders and different ways of experiencing them. And they can manifest in ways that really take years to play out. So you are absolutely right to use the word and really own that word trauma. What the charity offers at the moment is six sessions of CBT and CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's quite, um, that's, that is the, uh, the kind of therapy that is the, the sort of first, the first choice of the NHS. It's very solution focused, it's quite structured it's not appropriate for everything. And actually what we are looking at at the moment is it's not necessarily the most appropriate thing for people who have been through trauma. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is to make people relive it or not have support in the right way. So another thing that we are looking at um, and we are hoping to, to roll out um, or to at least pilot within the next year is a more trauma informed type of therapy. 
So it's not there yet. And I would really encourage you to, again, to call the, the bullying advice line because you will be speaking to someone, to, to Justine in the first instance, but the team, as I say, is growing, who is clinically trained and who is an expert in these issues. And that is the first sort of port of call to get the right kind of emotional support. Although the charity itself can't provide you with uh, trauma-informed, sort of a trauma-type therapy, um, we can, in some circumstances, if, if that is what you uh, have been recommended by a doctor, or if through talking to Justine, that's the conclusion that you come to, that that is something that would be extremely beneficial to you, but you can't afford it, or it's just prohibitively expensive. Um, there are circumstances where the charity could help you pay for that as well. So it's not the case that we, the charity can't provide it at all. It's not something, it's not one of our regular services but we don't have to say no to anything. So there are there are ways that we can help you if people really are suffering and, and are really experiencing negative impacts of being bullied or harassed at work. Um, and um, I'm really pleased, at least I know it's, it's not right now, but I'm pleased that we are trying to respond to the needs of the industry and look at the most appropriate type of therapy that can be delivered, which again, sounds like I'm really kind of blowing, blowing the charity's trumpet but that's very unusual to get any kind of other type of therapy through any kind of um employee assistance program or charity helpline so we're we're trying to be as, as as brave and as pioneering and as agile as we can so i hope it is coming and in the meantime there are ways in which we can help i hope Great. um lawrence, lawrence you, yeah lawrence you have your hand up yeah, Hello. thank you. Um, good evening. Good evening. Hope everyone's doing all right. All my webcams gone out of focus. There. Oh. Um, um, yeah, I just had a question about the um, yeah, getting access to the support, getting access to the therapy. Um, are there like are there certain qualifications for getting that? Are certain people more entitled to that than others based upon their experience, based upon whether they've been bullied or harassed? I know I'm just reading um, on your app on the caller app. It says that harassment is a uh, um, is illegal. Is bullying illegal as well? Um, yeah. So my question just relates to who has access and is there yeah. a priority list? Um and there's a couple of questions in there so uh no it's not about what's happened to you so anyone who has worked in the industry for two years um and it doesn't have to be two consecutive years because we understand that people who are freelance particularly have breaks in between jobs um can access our support so uh, if you are in the industry and you have been working um and you have uh i would very much encourage you to call the support line i won't go i, I won't go into all the eligibility criteria here partly because I can't, because there are lots of detail, but it is, it's pretty generous. If you've been working in the industry, um, you should be able to access, access the support. And it's absolutely not based on what happened to you. So there's, there's no sort of prioritization of someone's experiences worse than others. It's absolutely open to everyone. And that's really important to us that it's accessible to everyone. You don't have to kind of earn it on merit. Um, and the second half to your question was, um, is bullying illegal? Uh, and that is, that is a, million dollar question for those of us who work on this issue because no it's not so when bullying as such becomes illegal is when it is in relation to one of these nine protected characteristics which are defined by the Equality Act so that's race, um, sex, age, uh, disability, I'm, I'm not going to list them all but um, you can you can access them elsewhere. Um, should bullying be illegal? Probably. It's one of the things that I know that the BFI is campaigning for. And many, I'm, I'm in touch with many other groups outside of our sector um, who are have been campaigning for this for a long time. Um, there are pressure groups which push for a legal definition of bullying for the use, uh, this, preventing the use of NDAs, um, more protection, more statutory protection for whistleblowers. So. Uh, there was an act that didn't get through Parliament called the Dignity at Work Act over 10 years ago. And there are moves afoot to try and get that legislation or something that looks a bit like it through. And the sort of the noises at the moment are quite positive, but we'll have to wait and see. You never quite know how things are going to play out. Um, thank you for your question. 
I think we can take one more question. That's a really good question actually from Helen in the chat, and then we will sadly have to bring us to a close. Um, there is Helen's question is there is a blurred line between banter and bullying. How can it be defined? Um, so we use the ACAS definition of bullying, and that's sort of fairly widely accepted, which is it's any behavior that is unwanted or makes you feel uncomfortable that is offensive, malicious, um, or humiliating, or makes you feel frightened and intimidated. Um, but the, the blurred line between banter and bullying is such a difficult one, especially in an industry like ours, where there is a culture of the way you behave on set, the way you speak to each other, the way you joke, the very kind of informal nature. We sort of pride ourselves on being quite informal. I appreciate that women behind the camera, um, women are quite often outnumbered by men in some of the technical roles. There are un other underrepresented groups who feel um, very much at a disadvantage sometimes when, oh, it's just a joke comes in. Um, Kate, you've got your hand up. I was just going to point out that the, that the key thing is that um, it's, it's about su subjectivity. So yeah, it's about the effect that, rather than the intent, isn't it? That is experienced as bullying by the person against whom those comments are made, then it is bullying for the purposes of the work that Lucy does and for purposes of my work. Um, it then, you know, that's then the threshold of it becoming illegal under civil law, which is the Equality Act 2010. And then there's, of course, the threshold of it becoming illegal under criminal law, which is when it escalates to the point of assault or threatening behaviors. Um, so it is this kind of sliding scale. And, and that's why I think it's really important to recognize collective accountability when it comes to these behaviors, because, um, you know, it's for the group, it's for a collective, it's for the entire industry really to set standards and say, look, this is what we'll tolerate and we will not tolerate any more than that. Or, you know, this, this is the standard that is not okay for us. And I think what's incredibly important is um, recognizing that subjective experience, particularly when it comes to discrimination in the Equality Act. So for example, if somebody says that they experienced racism, there's a habit of people saying, oh, well, maybe that's not what they meant by that language. Maybe it's a generational thing, you know, this kind of thing. And actually, no, it's a subjective experience. That is how that was experienced. You know, um, it, it's really important that we get comfortable with that. We cannot keep trying to explain away sexual harassment or, or any other kind of discrimination um, by it not being intended. We have to recognize and respect that subjective experience because it's that that really minimizes people. It is that that leads to poor mental health outcomes. It is that that leads to people leaving the industry as I did for many, many years because of sexual harassment and not wanting to come back. So, you know, it's really, you know, the key thing actually to take away is that we need to start listening to people and recognizing their experience of bullying regardless of the intention of the perpetrator. Yeah. I just say, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Helen, oh, yes, yes, it was your question. Yeah, just to follow on from my comment is that I, a lot of the time that that those comments can be quite insidious and 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 not that obvious. You know, I I was an operator and I I had a um, an alpha male focus puller, and you know there was just there was just very subtle undermining comments that you can't actually nail as being bullying. But they were they were set to um, be undermining, but in a very subtle, sm small way, you know, that just picked away at little scabs, you know, and um, it, it's quite hard to put those in a, a solid form to actually make a case. Yeah, but so you know, they all make you feel uncomfortable and you ride it. And I was, you know, a lot younger than him and he was, you know, an older alpha male who hadn't sort of progressed any further. So I think he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder about, you know, a younger female actually being a senior role to him as well. And um, yeah, it's a really sticky wicket, isn't it? It's a really hard ground to sort of I mean, um, I, I think that's what we've really tried to address in the app, really, because, and it's, it's why I don't think anyone should feel obliged to report, because 
it's not it's not for you having that experience to have to defend that experience or persuade somebody that it was valuable or important i mean it's what they colloquially call these days microaggressions um what we think is really important is being able to tell people that this is happening in a binary way um that that is bullying behavior it's having an impact on you it's making you feel lesser it's making you feel humiliated it's making you feel all the things that those kind of behaviors can make you feel and actually it's for the organization's leadership because of their own business interests and requirements of setting a safe place to live to take action to try to raise those standards and address those issues and make sure you have the support that you have because those mm -hmm. are the kind of things that actually are really damaging I mean, they really are those kind of insidious day to day, every day, those kind of chipping away at someone's confidence. That is the kind of thing that makes for really terrible working experiences. And that is not the kind of thing that you can imagine yourself filling out an HR report and going through a grievance procedure with, because frankly, you would feel, you know, it, it would be a further humiliation in many ways to, to, to have to do that. So we're, we're very keen to make sure that those experiences are fully recognized and that there are collective accountability for them. I don't think that people should be fired for that type of behavior, personally. I think people need to be educated about the impact of that behavior so that if they persist with it, there can be consequences for them. And I think that's everyone's responsibility. That's everyone, you know, if we see it, if we experience it, it's, it's you know, really trying to make sure that we as well kind of walk the walk and treat everyone else as we would hope to be treated ourselves. Yeah, I think that point about about uh, doing it collectively. Um, so the the it's almost a rhetorical question, you know, how can you define the difference between banter and bullying? Well, that's what's so difficult. You can't because you can, you know, you can always someone saying something can always say, oh, it was just a joke. But what's what's acceptable uh, in a culture does change over time, and that needle does change very slowly. But the way that it changes is by you being in a network of your peers and saying, I felt really uncomfortable with this, am I imagining it? And talking about it to someone else, or if you see it happening to someone else, just going in to offer them support afterwards. You may not feel like you want to say, hey, you shouldn't do that. But where you feel comfortable, you know, offering your, as it's sort of called now, allyship, um, you know, and gently, slowly naming it, just pointing it out you don't have to sort of say hey I'm going to report you but just yeah to, to try and to to let them know or to as Kate says make it make it clear that it's it's had an effect on you and that's what they need to understand um, and feel responsible for and I would say that spot is really useful for that because you can just quickly jot down literally a comment and then you get this dashboard and actually when you've got a whole dashboard of x said this did that in an email did this then you can be a bit like you know what this is a pattern this is okay you know these things actually probably do amount to something i'm not imagining it i'm not going crazy which people can often think that they are so um i really understand the question and i appreciate you asking it brandon you've had your hand up for ages uh, thank you. It's it's more of a of a comment, really, in just how the industry works, and that we're we're working a lot of the time in in a very pressurized, intense atmosphere, which can lend itself to allow bullying to happen because you're only seeing them for five weeks or six weeks, maybe if it's a film. So people can maybe allow themselves to get away with things that they wouldn't otherwise do because they think, well, I'm not I'm not going to see that person. Um, and it's really about setting the tone from, from the get-go. There is, whether it's low budget or huge budget, whatever the production, there is that amount of money for which uh, people really at the top are responsible for, your producers, your directors, your heads of department, and that they can then feel a pressure on themselves that they have to get this done. And so people get chewed out, people get bollocked as it would be called in my day like in front of people and it's and it's 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 accepted you know i'm i'm going back from when i started but the, but the first productions i was in you know co coincidentally like there were there were some which were produced by and produced and directed by women and a couple that weren't and the atmosphere on both was was quite different certainly in terms of uh the sexism that would be 
the, the talk, uh, the way men would talk amongst themselves, techies, people who, who you would say, well, that was, that was back in then, and, you know, electricians, you know, and like they're 50, whatever, and, you know, it's just, it's just that way. Um, I would not hear as much of it. Um, and I was, this is when, like, I'm, I, was, I was a young, young kid at the time, but I remember being surprised that that kind of talk was going on then, and we're talking about the 80s here, but then the next production uh, produced by and directed by a woman and not not the same. I don't know whether it was just the atmosphere, whether they thought they would be um, overheard. So really the comment is, is that someone had said earlier, you need to talk to studios, get them involved. And I think yes, because they have a lot more of a corporate structure and setup, but producers and directors and HODs, and they're the people, and we've all been on, well, hopefully you've been on happy shoots and then you've been on those shoots, which are just like a grind. It's it's just tough all the way through and everyone's unhappy. So I'm really just thinking about like setting the tone. If there are directors here, producer here, you set the tone and uh, and you can call it out quicker than anyone who might be wanting to work again, wanting to work if they're it's like, you know, in, in, the, in a department, they, they want to work with that cameraman again and they kind of like they... Keep, they might keep quiet. Yeah, so, yeah thank I mean, you. That's very well said, Brendan. I totally agree with you, but, but I do think that one of the issues that we have in the industry right now is a lack of leadership experience among our leaders. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of producers and HODs who just don't have people management skills. And what is missing for me is that moment exactly as you're describing where a standard is set, where we say, this is the expectation of you. And if you fall beneath that, there will be consequences because that's the only way that you can really have a fair and equitable way of there, of there being consequences that the standard was set and there's some way, of, you know, yeah, you're, you're beneath that standard. If you never set the standard, then it's just, you're, you're in a free fall. You know what I mean? People yeah. are just, uh, it's in people's nature. They're just going to be pushing the boundaries, doing whatever, whatever, whatever is wanted. So I think it's so important that we set a standard. And I do think that, um, you know, given where we are in the industry, it's got to be everybody's job to help set that standard and help maintain that standard and to yeah. demand better leadership, really, to be honest. Yeah, so I would, I would think that it's, it comes down to standards and, you know, I... Maybe, maybe I'm a bit of a snob or maybe it's because, you know, I started like working behind camera, as I say, back in the 80s. But, uh, you know, when things were staffed and crewed and paid properly and now it's great and exciting that, that in the sense that technology is in your pocket, you know, that you can go and you can shoot something, you can edit something. But what, what ends up is that you have uh, people who have a phone and, and are prepared to max out a few credit cards and are prepared to do whatever they think they need to do to get their vision kind of like made and done. And, uh, and that's really something that needs to be looked at and watched out for. And that may be a situation of where if you are, if you are someone who has a bit more experience in the industry, they may be the producer or director in a senior position, but that I suppose is where it takes a bit more courage on the part of the individual to say, look, um, this is not, this is not how things are done. This is not, you might, you might get this film done and people might say, wow, that's amazing. Look at it, it's a great film and it was made for 25,000. But if you, if you actually really want to uh, have a career, this is, not, this is not doing you any favors. Yeah, I mean, the, the other really important thing to note is that um, healthier, mentally healthier workplaces are more productive and it is a business decision to make sure that you achieve that kind of mentally healthy workplace. Um, the, the ROI for investing in mental health in the workplace is five pounds for every pound spent, which is a much better ROI than any investment in any piece of film that's ever been <laughs> made pretty much. You know, it's, 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 it's a sensible way for any business person to invest in film and TV is to invest in mental health within the workplace. It's the most sensible thing that you can do as a business person in this industry. And, um, you know, as much as I, of course, want people to want to treat each other better and want to be kind and generous, et cetera, et cetera. I also think that there is a really big argument for saying, look, we cannot afford as an industry certain things from happening. We can't afford to dump Bulletproof when it's halfway through a series. We cannot afford to replace Kevin Spacey in films. We cannot afford to take Viewpoint to ITV2 
we cannot afford to dump entire projects that Noel Clark was attached to. His entire company was dumped. You know, that had huge ripple effect on our industry. We absolutely cannot afford to lose the sheen of this industry that means that young people who are currently in film school or currently in places like the London Screen Academy or Elam where my daughter is studying filmmaking, those young people are looking at our industry and saying, wow, that's a bit kind of grubby. That doesn't look like a place to work where I will be valued and where my creative energy will, will lead to fantastic working relationships and collaborative experiences and people will hear my voice and viewpoint and respect me. Why would young people come and work in this, in, in this industry if that's what they see of us? So, you know, we've got this massive opportunity in this country to be the growth sector of the entire UK economy. We're making incredible international high quality productions. We need additional skills coming into the industry. We need the best of the best. We need those fantastic students coming through and delivering the, the skills so that we can make these, make these programs. But we won't be able to if it looks like a really shitty place to work. Because why would people come and work in this industry if they don't think they're going to be treated well? So, so those are all things that I think are, are really strong arguments to be taken to commissioners and studios and um, the you know financiers. It's a business decision to treat people better. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Brendan. I think we probably better wrap, wrap it up now. Um, this will be available to watch again. I've I've put my email address and the number for the support line in the chat and. Please, I really encourage you to call support line uh, and make an appointment with the with the brilliant advisor. Um, we are doing lots of work in this area, and I would again love to hear of any examples of best practice, or if you think that there are people that we could go and spread the word to who'd be open to having a session like this. That would be great. Um, I'm going to share some resources with Aga. Um, there's a, we've got a, a fact sheet on on our on our services, um, so she can email that amongst the network. Um, and there's lots of contact details on our website. And really, um, I'm just so grateful that you've given up your evening after probably a really long day of shooting to be here. Oh, Heather, hi. Hiya, uh, sorry, was, did you say um, it was yourself and Paula Lamont that I, I should get Sai, I put you in touch with Sai? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, you. that would be great. Yeah, I'd love to hear from him, I'm sure she would too. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for joining us, um, and we, we hope we can help. Please spread the word. Please spread the word because not enough people know about our services, and we are here for everyone. Uh, and um, I wish you all a very good evening. Please, please use the app and let us know if you're working in any productions that want to be part yes. of the phase. And let us know if you hate it. Tell us what you hate about it. Let us try to fix it. Thank you, Kate. Kate and thank you for your time as well. Kate and uh, Lucy, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. 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 Th